Good morning and welcome to this week's recruitment discussion with Jump. This week, we're going to challenge the culture of high-performing sales team and help you unlock the potential within your business to drive your business through 2024. But as always, we're going to start with some little stats to try sort of set the scene and set the tone for this. 65% of outside sales executives, those are the executives who don't visit their clients, are attaining, so those are visit their clients, sorry, are attaining quotas 10% higher than inside sales reps, i.e. those who's in the office. More than 40% of salespeople say that prospecting is the most challenging part of sales, followed by closing 36%. Obviously, closing is a very interesting one because what we're saying about closing is that 92% of all clothes are done either face-to-face -face or over the phone. So if you take that first stat, 65% of the people outside going out and visiting their clients have a 10% higher closing rate. It sort of says you should be going out and seeing your clients. Prospects are more open to communication with the seller's industry via events, 34%, LinkedIn, 21%, text, 21%, and voicemail, 21%, and social media, 18%. In 2007, it took 3.8 calls to reach a prospect. In today's market, it takes eight. 85% of prospects and customers are dissatisfied with their telephone experience. So it says we need to train our people better. And 73% of executives say they would prefer a sales professional who has been referred by someone they know. And 91% of customers say they would give a referral, but only 11% of people say they would ask for it. Gartner reported that organizations that institute or put into place an effective sales training and coaching program reap a 19% improvement on sales performance. And they characterize that in a very simple way. They characterize it that a sales performance or training program isn't an event that happens three or four times a year. It's an event that happens constantly and continuously. The value of a high-performing sales team displayed internal and external uh, rates. And in a recent document, they were highlighted that these were the values and traits that we should be looking for. Self-motivated, customer-focused, well-trained, collaborative, data-driven, acceptable or adaptable, um, collaborative, trustworthy, and the final one was that they stated they need to be strongly led by leaders who are proactive at setting clear goals and expectations, provide continuous guidance, support and feedback and accountability, and all within the context of seeking to develop a personal and caring relationship with their team member. The last step absolutely will typify whether we've got that right or not. In recruitment, the average retrition in year overall in recruitment is 43 percent in year one it's north of 70 percent a high performing team on average has between 20 to 50 percent lower than the national average which is 21 percent so what that says is that our average is twice as high as the national average and high performing sales teams on on average are between 20 and 50 percent lower than the national average so retaining our people is really important so have we got that self-motivated customer focus etc right and are they led by strong people as always i'm joined by dave and paul today uh heather's with uh, a client so i'm going to jump straight into the question i think we've got a lot to cover today so first question how can an organization proactively cultivate a sales-centric culture that fosters high performance and drives results? I think the first answer to that comes down, and you've just touched on this, Howard, it comes down to making sure that you are um, recruiting the right kind of people, and it's sort of inverted commas. You know, our, our industry, if you, and, you know, we, we deal with this on a daily basis. A lot of people, a lot of uh, recruitment businesses are, I, mean, I have to say this, being honest, very reactive. They deal with uh, stuff coming in. Um, so they live off of longstanding clients, longstanding relationships, often with just a small number of companies, and they'll understandably react forcibly when they're given vacancies. They'll come back strongly, try to fill those jobs. Um, for me, a South-centric organization, and, and to, in terms of South-centric people, 
are in a sense the opposite. They're not necessarily service delivery consultants. These are proactive salespeople. These are people that are very acutely aware of looking for new business opportunities and going out and talking not only to existing clients to generate new business, but also looking for new opportunities, uh, taking business from competitors and being aware of activities of customers or potential customers via social media and other methods of understanding what's happening. These are people that are genuinely interested and excited about getting out in front of clients and developing new opportunities. So I think the answer to the question really begins with what kind of people are we bringing into our organizations? Are they fit for purpose when you're talking about a sales culture or are they service delivery people? And I know we've talked endlessly in the past about 360 degree recruiters and there's a very large discussion around whether we should continue to do that or whether we should split the roles out. But if you want a sales centric performance, you need people that are genuinely interested and able to go out and look for new opportunities. Um, and if I if I could be, um, I mean, I agree with everything Paul said because it's uh, absolutely spot on. The, the one thing I'd just like us to think about, slightly controversially, is actually define high performance, mm. because I think our expectations often as leaders are much higher than the ability of most of our people to deliver. If you remember uh, last year, we went to that event at LinkedIn, and they said that in 2023, the average billing for a consultant was 96k and 20 years later with the advent of technology and all the things that we have at our disposal the average billing was 96k so what is high performance is high performance 110k is high performance double what everybody else does and i think you've got to look at it as a leader and define for yourself what you regard as a high performing individual or a high performance team um, because often when we set targets everybody at the same level has the same target and yet the ability for someone to be a high performing person uh, can be different by person yeah and given that most of the clients that we deal with have less than 50 consultants it isn't beyond our ability to look at them individually and say actually for you high performance may be a target of I don't know, 120, 130, but for someone else, it may be 150, 160. So I think we've got to, to, to foster that culture. And I think we've just got to define for ourselves as leaders, what do we regard as high performance, better performance, okay performance, and your, your, your normal performance? It's always interesting asking the questions and then sort of thinking about how you're going to ask, answer the questions is, you know, following you guys and then following heather sometimes here it's sort of what do i say at the end of those type of things or how do i add to that oh, I you've always with... got lots to say oh, yeah. you? you're never no, sure no, no, never it's never been short of things to say so, so, so i was going to say you actually both of you hit the nail on the head in what i was going to say but what i've added to my thought process was there is that when we invest in actually finding the right people the right values and behaviors the right will to do the job and then the skills and get the right people in the job Generally, what they're done is they're managed by the most influential people in the business, which is either the owners of the business or the senior line or the senior big people, etc., within the business. And it's them that set the tone and value. And it's them that set how people are dealt with in the business. And so if you think about that stat that north of 70 percent of mm. people entering recruitment in year one leave in year one. It says that those people are the people that we should be investing in because they're the bastions of the behaviors and values of the business. And if they aren't right, that's a direct reflection of their behaviors and their, I suppose, their values. And therefore, might be recruiting the right people in based on the values that we've got, but our management line might not actually be actually living those values. So I think it's understanding what good looks like in the first place, mm. but I think it's what good looks like for your own business when you're recruiting mm. your own business and recruiting that and making everyone live by that. And I think that was the bit that I want to get to that absolutely it's about the recruiting the right people, but then it's having the right people managing the right people. That's a good point. And I think they are the most influential people in recruitment today, and yet they're the people who have the least training. They're the people yeah. who lack support. They're the people who actually don't know how to manage people, and that is absolutely detrimental creating a high-performing culture. Yeah, yeah. 
no, yeah, because they, they they don't build the culture. So I think that's where we start. And that's what we're doing. I was I was down in London yesterday with a client uh, building a high performing uh, sales management team. And it's interesting how their view of what high performance was, because it was very different to what you were saying there, mm -hmm. Dave. But it's horses for courses based on their individual performance and what state they go. So I think you've got to find out what it looks like. Uh, by the question. way, you, you did say bastions, didn't you? Because I've worked for a few bastions myself over the years. That was the word you used, wasn't it? <laughs> Don't lower the tone, Paul. Don't lower the tone. It's always you, always you that drags it down. But, <laughs> But there you go. But yes, you're right. And I have to. But there you go. Um, so question two, then let's look at that in a different way. Then what strategies or methodologies have you found most effective in identifying and nurturing talent within a sales team to maximize their potential? Look, I, I think this, I'm going to go back to the basic point again. I think as, as, a, as leaders, as owners of businesses, you've got to be very clear about what kind of people you want to bring in. And I think that comes down to something fairly basic, which is, what does the job description look like? You know, what, what is it you want from people? And your point, how it's very valid. You know, what does success look like? What do we expect from people? And if you're not clear about that, it's all a bit fuzzy. Then coming up with strategies or methodologies um, in identifying nurturing talent to get out and sell and develop your business just isn't going to happen. You, it starts from the very basic element of what kind of skill sets do we need? And uh, do they complement the current skill sets of the people I have in the business? Are we trying consistently to find this elusive, um, I don't know, gold digger, this person is going to make such a difference to our organization, or are we being realistic about the skill sets we're looking for? So I think it, it is a question of stepping back. I think you can... Uh, use a template that looks at the uh, people that in your business who do very well in certain situations. You can come up with a foundation, um, assess the people that you already got. What do they possess? What do you admire? What do you feel you can develop further with those people? And can we recruit others like them? And I do think it starts from that position. I also think it comes down to something else that we talk a lot about. And that is, you know, if you're looking at nurturing talent and identifying the right people, then you need to be close enough to your people to understand what their talents are, whether they're obvious or they're hidden. How do you know what they are and how can you extend and develop those talents um, in, a, in a way that is great for them to develop their careers and, and enable them to develop long-term futures with your business, but that's consistent also with what you need for your business that's going to help you to develop your company. And I think that the, the two things go hand in, in glove. You also make the point rightly, Howard, about the leaders of those people and what sort of support and development and training are they getting um, to ensure that they in turn can develop the good people around them. It's quite a complicated answer, I know, and it's quite a complicated question. Um, but I think very often when we look at uh, recruitment companies, they haven't looked at their job descriptions in years. They haven't really assessed what skill sets they need. And I think it's something that needs to be done literally on an annual basis because we work in an environment that's changing at such a rapid pace that what might have felt completely appropriate 18 months, two years ago may no longer be entirely appropriate because of the changing nature of clients' demands and the actual economic changes that are occurring around us, not to mention um, AI and all the technology that's developing at such a rapid pace. So it needs annual appraisals to understand what kind of people and what kind of skill sets we're looking for. Yeah, I think um, one of the strategies that we employed, actually, Paul, you, you and I did it with when we were working together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The company, is we, we asked them to look at their best performers and actually... Yeah work out what the DNA was of their best performers because they had a lot of a uh, quite a young sales force and some of them didn't make it some of them did one or two of them were just brilliant so we just said well look let's go and find out what it is about Rachel what it is about Ben why are they so much better than the others what is it that they've got what how do they behave how do they talk how do they communicate internally externally to your point out are they going out and seeing more customers or not what what is it what was in their dna that made them better and then try to make that more like the job spec so rather than this is your job spec as a consultant you'll do this this and this it became this is your job spec you'll do what ben and rachel did 
and this is what made them successful. So that's that's a technique that that I've seen that, that we've seen work. Um, and the other thing is that they've got to own it. If you give to them everything that you want them to do, and they feel they've been given it, but they don't really own it, then I don't think they'll they have as much of a chance as being successful or as being a higher performing individual than if they own it. So if they can write down, actually, this is what I'm going to do. Even the people who are brand new who don't know recruitment necessarily, you know, get them to write down in, in their own handwriting or typing if they have to. But I, I found it as bizarre as it sounds, literally getting them to write it down on a piece of paper and they begin to own it a little, a little bit more. And you refer to that, Paul, as you said about in, in yeah. their reviews. You then refer to what they wrote down. You can tweak it as as you go along, but you know annual annual targets now seem a little bit with the way the market's changing, the way things are going on. They should be reviewed every every three months. I know we have to build our budget on an annual target, but we do need to review it with what's going on in the market and all the changes. So I think, but again, absolutely right, and I think understanding the drives of your people, and then creating that personal connection as the leaders owners managers of the people and learning to motivate and what demotivates your people so you can understand how they feel and i yep. think it's how they feel that's really important so if i asked everybody that's on this uh, call now on this webinar now that if i asked you to think about what the most successful thing that you've done it creates a really good feeling inside it because you, you start to remember that and i think that's what managers need to do is a you know it's how people feel and how they perform but also you need to know how people feel when they fail because you need to learn how to manage those systems. And I think those feelings are embedded in each other and those expectations of how we're going to make people feel are set during that interview process. So when you're nurturing talent, if you're con constantly tapping into that sort of really high-end feeling of success, then guess what? They start to feel more successful, they'll be more successful and you'll be the catalyst for that performance. But if you constantly create that feeling of failure, which lots of managers do, pick out the areas of failings and drive that, then guess what? You create an area that fails. So I think tapping into what we've said here and finding what good looks like, et cetera, but tapping into people's feelings of what good looks like, how they feel when they perform at their best, what bad look looks like, and how do you then create those feelings is really important. Because if you're creating the feeling of failure constantly, guess what? People think they're failing and therefore they'll fail more because they think that's the feeling that they've got and that's how you're pushing it towards them so how you manage people your kpis etc become really important because they all create a feeling of either positivity or negativity and i think that then detracts from sales performance or sales eliteness from there so as we move forward then in your experience then how do tox employees both management and sales people impact dynamic teams and overall performance and what steps can an organization take to mitigate that influence and i'm not going to take get rid of the, the people okay well i mean I, <laughs> I i think your key word is toxic and, you know and I, i'm sorry to be slightly against what you've just said but i i, I won't uh, i wouldn't tolerate and never did tolerate toxic or toxicity in my business um, no matter who people were. And it's not easy because, of course, uh, to your point, Howard, you can't just sack people. I think there are, you, you've got to get deeper into uh, what the situations are. I mean, there's a difference between critical thinking and problem solving. And those two things need to be looked at. If you're going to have to make difficult decisions, you have to remove emotions. You have to look critically at a situation. You have to dig deep, investigate why people are becoming toxic what what's causing that toxicity um is it entirely down to them are there things affecting them are there issues in their personal lives that causing them to be bitter and not particularly pleasant in the workplace and so on i mean we often talk about behaviors and values and um, i to my mind this is such such an important thing when you look at great businesses uh, consistently doing well. I mean, not just one year, but consistently developing, consistently growing. You will find unquestionably outstanding behaviors and values, great culture in those organizations. And you said it right at the beginning, Howard, where you, where you have great businesses, you will have 
very low attrition rates. People stay, people stick around, people develop long-term careers in those organizations. And you end up, as we've all thankfully experienced in the past, finding yourself working in what feels like a family culture. It's a family environment. People literally are very fond or even love each other. And, you know, to get that isn't an accident. But if you have somebody or people in that environment that is diametrically opposite in personality and attitudes and behaviours to the values you hold dear, you have to deal with that. Now, for, to me, it's about getting in quickly. If you, st if you see and you understand them or things are brought to your attention that people are not behaving correctly, then don't kick it into the long grass, which people often do. They, they fear uh, the outcomes. They worry about having difficult, challenging conversations, confrontational conversations with people. So they, they kind of duck around it. They, they, they kind of hedge around the problem. They don't have direct conversations. And in my experience, what happens is things get worse. They don't get better. Um, and we reach a point where ultimately something um, occurs, i.e. the person leaves or we end up getting into a very difficult um, uh, pip with somebody ultimately getting them out of the business. It's not great. So I think being close to people and dealing with situations very early when they occur at the moment they occur is how you start to manage those situations. But just to be slightly contrary, Howard, if you do everything you can to resolve a situation to the best of your ability – to bring a situation around, to get people to behave in the right way. And there is a refusal from that individual. They won't change. They won't change their behaviours and values. Then I'm sorry, they do have to leave the business because that toxicity can absolutely impact other people and will cause others to leave the company, will cause your attrition rate to increase, will certainly damage the, uh, the culture in your company and probably damage relationships with clients and potentially candidates as well. And will also suppress the development and growth of your profit. So you don't want it. And I'm giving you examples of how you can try to avoid it. Um, but if it really reaches a point where you can't, you, you simply can't tolerate it any longer, there is only one um, outcome to that, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, I, I take your, your point out that you can't say get rid of them, but I'm going to say get rid of them. Um, Paul's made an excellent point. As leaders, as human beings, as people, we want the best for our people. If they are toxic in whatever way that looks and you've tried your best to change that behaviour for whatever reason, that it's it's there. Um, the longer you keep them, the worse it affects your culture. The more difficult it is for you to hire, the more difficult it damages your reputation. And my heart is always for people and helping them to change and you know, wanting them to be better. But if you know in your heart of hearts that that isn't going to happen, you, you, have to, you have to get rid of it. And I have not, I don't think, it was fair to say, in my recruitment career, I cannot think of one person I've met who in dealing with a toxic person has not regretted getting rid of them earlier. Hmm. Not not one person. I mean, I'm, and I'm talking about hundreds of different people that we've met in our time, mm. both when we were running businesses and being advisors to businesses, who said, "I'm really glad I carried on just that little bit longer." Because when you so, know, when you know, you know. You do. And, yeah. and, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to argue about you. Know. I'm not going to argue against you because you're right. It, it, the answer is to remove them as quick as you can. However, I think we've got to take a step back at some point. Mm and look at our processes because when we recruited that person they were the best person to get through that process yeah. and therefore yeah. we blame the people very quickly when we should be looking at the process yes that person may have to be removed from the business we can't change their, their their mindset and change their how they behave but we've got to think that we have allowed those people to get into our business in the first place and that's our processes it's not the person's fault. And therefore, we've got to look at our processes and change those processes. And that's what I was hoping to come from you guys. But you're right. That toxic level has to be removed at some place. And we've all benefited from, from doing that. So let's look at some type, so slightly I different. To add to that, as a, as a side, that applies to clients as well. Absolutely. That's a good point, Dave, yeah. We have clients that do not treat us as well as we deserve to be treated 
or do not treat our consultants as well as they deserve to be treated. And as leaders of our businesses, sometimes we have to override that and say, you know what, we're not dealing with them anymore. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll add to that, Dave, and also say, if you look at that from a management point of view, then your clients are your consultants. Yeah. And how you treat your consultants yeah. can lead to toxicity because yeah. you, know, you, you rub people up the, other, up the wrong way. So can we then share examples of successful sort of client engagement initiatives that have di directly contributed to improving sales performance and team performance as a result? Funny enough, I've just uh, been on a call this morning to a client where we were talking about business development strategies um, and how we can start to develop uh, the business further. And there's a fairly typical conversation around the fact that the data uh, uh, can't be doubted. Um, this particular owner has spent quite a bit of time looking at uh, the amount of clients that uh, look clients spend over the last two, three years, both perm and contract slash temp. Um, and the upside is lots of new business, lots of new clients coming on board. Uh, but the downside, lots of existing clients dropping spend, some disappearing completely. And of course, that usual situation where we can see people spending on perms, but not on contract or temp or vi and vice versa. I think it, it comes down to something that you've got to analyze the metrics on a regular basis. It's not something you do on, a, on an occasional basis. It's really important to be looking at your management information every month and establishing which clients are growing and, and understand why, um, where you can cross-sell and upsell. And, and and talk the strat talk about the strategies to develop that further. We know that winning new business has a greater chance of success through working closely with clients that already work with us, that already trust us, that like us. Um, we've often talked about the Boston Matrix and other methods of identifying that. Um, but uh, it's it's not unusual um, to see clients to see clients spending with us in some areas, but not all areas. And I often ask my clients, why is that? And I think it comes down to something pretty simple. We just don't communicate as well as we could with clients. We don't talk to them about what else we could do for them. And the very simple answer to that problem, that conundrum is that we're not close enough to our clients. We don't see them regularly enough. I always say that we should never go longer than three months without a face-to-face -face discussion with clients. Now, you can do that via a video method, of course. Obviously, it's far better to get in front of clients face-to-face. -face. But we need to be tight to clients. They work as we do in an ever-changing environment. And the opportunities to do more business with them or better business with them or different business with them is always there, provided we're working as true consultants. So the, the answer to the question, Howard, about successful client engagement initiatives comes down to that very basic point. We need to be very close to clients. And we can't be close to every client. We don't have the time of the day to do that. And actually, as, as we were saying earlier, as Dave's just mentioned, some clients we don't want to be close to. But the clients that offer us opportunities to grow with them uh, are clients we need to be seeing on a very, very regular basis. And the more often we meet them, strangely enough, the more um, the more opportunities present themselves. So I, I'm very much into this high touch, this high touch situation with clients. And, you know, the human touch is something that is now some, something that's growing, an opportunity for us to grow as technology takes over some of the more mundane elements of our industry. We're presenting us with opportunities to spend much more time with our clients and a failure to do that will send businesses in the wrong direction. Um, it comes back to the earlier question about what kind of people do we want in our business going forward? Yeah, and uh, here's a strategy that I'm going to suggest or say without giving you any evidence for this client that it's worked yet because it's brand new. But the owner of a business that I'm dealing with, they've decided to go to their clients and say, we're reviewing our supply, given that the market's getting tighter, we wondered whether you would like to be on our PSL. And they're creating a preferred list of suppliers. And I, I don't know whether it's worked yet because it's early doors, but what it's doing, it's getting the owner of the business out seeing all the clients and talking to them and getting to him to articulate, in this case, why they're doing that. 
and then they're having a conversation about the market. To your point at the beginning, Howard, about getting there and finding out what's going on and 60 to 10% better when you're in front um, of a client. So they're doing that and then they're coming back and they're going to make a decision as to who they're going to do, deal with. So it's early doors. I, I feel a little bit reluctant to mention it because I can't tell you whether it's been successful or not. But given the people I know who run that business, I kind of think I've got a hunch that it is going to be successful. And it's not its not a gimmick. It's its genuinely, we can't deal with everybody. We're going to pick and choose. So, so it's interesting, isn't it? So I've just written a client acquisition strategy. And part of the acquisition strategy is about human acquisition and about you how you acquire the human and what you do with the human. And part of that then is about how you then win hearts and minds and, and drive from there. But a lot of it is driven by the data that, that comes from that. And I'm not talking about your traditional KPIs, but in-depth data. And what we've worked out is that in-depth data then starts to lead us where the company's strengths are, where the company's weak weaknesses are. And therefore, we can then build individual and team building sessions to train and coach the people to deliver a better service, a better product. And it's using that data to identify where the gaps are in your business and working from there. So it's, you know, it's not about saying how do we how do you achieve that goal? It's not about achieving the goal. It's about unlocking the person's potential to achieve that goal and train them to achieve that goal and therefore how they feel have they got the autonomy to express themselves do they understand what they're selling all become contributors to them hitting the goal therefore the team the business goals etc naturally fall into place so i think that high data intelligence that shows and identifies strengths and weaknesses within the business is really important and then it's about your high performing managers tapping into those businesses and creating high performance environments that enable people to grow and that enables them to actually manage their clients and you naturally then get rid of clients who are toxic you naturally go out and take talk to clients that you want to do business with because you want to work with people with the right mindset and i think it is about what everyone said but i think it's about going that extra distance and saying if you can put in new strategies you've got to train the people to deliver those strategies and therefore it has to be in your strength wheelhouse and not in your weakness wheelhouse. And most of the things that we try and sell, I think, are in most people's weaknesses because we've never really trained them to sell them properly. And I think we've got to change that. And that helps develop you know, high-performing cultures. Yeah. So let's push that onto the leadership then. What role does leadership play in creating an environment where average performers feel empowered to excel and high performers are continually challenged to seek new heights. Well, I, you know, I, I think we all do, but I certainly came from that kind of background. I think it's it's about setting the uh, the bar. Um, what level of performance do we expect from people? And Dave was making this point earlier about what do we think is is good performance? Uh, is it moderate is it mediocre is that the is that the benchmark i mean you can say to people when they're being interviewed this is what we expect from you and we can give figures but then when they get into the business and they start looking around and they see what we tolerate from certain people i in terms of their monthly returns their revenues then they, they understand very quickly that what we said at the interview wasn't necessarily true that the level of acceptable performance is lower than they expected so what you've got to do, I think, is to have a not, not an unreasonable expectation from people. I mean, giving people stretch targets to the extent that they can't can't get to them is detrimental to um, developing a great culture. But you've certainly got to be um, getting people to, to look constantly to improve themselves. And that means you're challenging people in a very positive way. But your expectation of performance is high. Um, and people need to understand that and they need to witness it too. They need to look around them and recognize that their colleagues are actually hitting those levels, are going beyond those levels. I think getting that high level performance in a business, and I, I without all, with all due modesty, I certainly did that in my uh, in the business I ran for many years, I, I, it is something that's very important. I mean, I, I can remember as a young younger person 
um, having great weeks or months and being and being told I'd done a great job or I was even brilliant, but then in the same conversation being told, well, that was great, but did you know that so and so in the other office just down the road you did a better had a better week? You know, you whatever you did, there was always the reminder that somebody else somewhere was doing better than you, so you were never allowed to less to rest on your laurels. They would tell you how well you were doing, but there was always this view that well, you can still do better because there are other people doing better than you. And although I, I think there is a level where that gets a little bit irritating, I do think that expectation that, look, you're doing great, but you can do better is, is true. And if you look at athletics as an example or any form of sport, there is always this view that whilst you're doing well, you can still do better. And this is sometimes about incremental gains. It's not necessarily giant leaps forward. And I think that's true in life. I think that whatever you're achieving, you can always do better. And getting that mentality into the business is really important as owners, as leaders. And I, I, as I say, it's kind of finding that balance. It's not being ridiculous with your expectations because that leads to people leaving. Uh, but equally, it's not settling on mediocre or average because that simply isn't going to drive your business forward. And it comes from the leadership, from skillful management, from the ability to say well done to people and really mean it and be giving the right development and training and coaching to people. Um, but it is definitely setting expectations and definitely selling, setting levels uh, that we expect people to get to and driving for that to that performance level through good quality management and coaching and development and training. And I think that the key word there for me, Paul, you said is balance. It isn't the same for everybody. And it's, it's understanding what makes someone tick uh, if they've bought into it, like I was saying at the beginning, then uh, away you go. You you know what they you you they know what you expect of them. <clears throat> they know what they have to deliver, and let's get the balance right. Um, so I used to do some work um, years ago with the Tom Peters organisation yeah. to have this um, this phrase MBWA, which was management by wandering around. And um, I guess now, as part of leadership, most of us do that. We're wandering the sales floor. We're talking to people. We're understanding where they're coming from. Um, so you know, if you don't do that, um, then you should. And if you've got people working from home more than they are in the office, then you still need to have that wandering around. You need to be um, online with them more often than not to make sure that they're doing the right things because most people crave direction. They crave leadership. They're happy to do what they're told, they just need to know what is expected of them. And if you get the balance right, um, then you can have high-performing teams. I think, to me, it's a very simple, and part of that is that walking around conversation there, Dave, that you were mentioning. I think it's very simple, is that, you know, as we've said, managers have a very high expectation of themselves and of their team, and sometimes their team don't level up to that expectation. But also the manager doesn't step down to help the people step yes. up and yeah. i think that's the big yeah. thing that if you want to empower average performers and create high performers that excel you've got to step down and help them step up and if you don't step down if you're always in your ivory tower or you're always saying well if i can do this you can do that etc cetera, etc cetera. and if you're sort of setting the bar too high then people can never achieve that bar. But if you set the bar a little bit lower and then keep increasing, keep increasing and keep increasing, then you can start to lift people extremely quickly. But it's a matter of stepping down to their level and understanding what they're doing to change that. And I think lots of managers still think that recruitment is, you know, if I was recruiting in the 1990s, then that's how recruitment is now. But it's not, it's changed. It's changed massively for these mm. people. And we've got to step down and understand what they're doing to help them step up and if we can't help them step up then again it's us not them that is the problem and we've got to start to think about us as managers as being the problem rather than the people being the problem or the process being the problem how do we as managers remove those blockages and enable people to perform at a higher level so if we move that forward how do you recommend addressing performance gaps within sales team while maintaining morale and motivation because that's the thing that sort of tends to happen is when we start to fail we start to drive harder and morale and motivation disappears and that compounds the issue so how do we recommend addressing performance gaps listen i think it's about transparency and i think it's about good quality communication um i think all good managers rely on uh, accurate data 
not emotions. It's really easy to be, you know, because we do get emotionally tied up with what goes on and because and, and, we're passionate, passionate about our business, passionate about our performance, passionate about our people, passionate about performing well for our clients and candidates and so forth. It's very easy to get emotional and passion's important. You know, if you don't care, you shouldn't be in the business. But at the same time, if you're going to start looking at what's what's not working or indeed what is working, have the data, have the information, have accurate information in front of you. I'm a great I'm a great one for looking carefully, very carefully at trends, at what's occurring, what are the numbers, what are the you mentioned the phrase, that lovely old phrase, KPIs a moment ago. What are the KPIs? Are we performing against the right metrics? So that when I speak to individuals, or I speak to the teams that where there are gaps, where things aren't quite working well, I'm talking to them about facts, not about my emotions, not that I think this isn't working well, that I, I have a feeling this isn't right, or someone's peeing me off, basically. I, it's not going to come from that position. I'm going to talk to them about what's going on, and I'm going to use basic facts, mathematics, and data to explain my position. When you do that, when you explain to people with hard facts, there's no discussion, no argument. It's a, as a matter of fact, and we then sit down and talk about how we're going to address those particular issues, those trends, things that aren't working well. And, you know, I think sales is a bit like an engine. It is an engine. If, it doesn't, if your engine in your car doesn't work suddenly, it isn't that you need to chuck the whole engine out. You need to identify which bit of the engine isn't working correctly. It's, it, it may be a minor adjustment, a small part that needs replacing, not the entire engine. And I think that looking at a sales team and looking at sales performance is a bit like that. Which bits need, need to be adjusted slightly? How do we improve something, a small element of what we're doing? That link if in the chain that might make all the difference, whether it's a person or it's a process, how do we do that? So come at it from the perspective of fact, not on emotion. Be open and transparent with people, both collectively and individually. And if they have their if they have pride in what they're doing, if they believe in themselves and they want to be a part of the business, they'll react very positively. Um, so it's about that. It's not about charging in like a raving lunatic every Monday and screaming and shouting or whatever because you're upset or unhappy about performance. Use your intelligence. Have rational thinking that's behind your your thought, your your processes and your your direction. That's where it begins, I think. I think that's absolutely right. I think um, so much of what we do in the day-to-day -day stuff in recruitment is still very much process-driven. Um, and I, I can use my favourite phrase, Paul, let the data decide. Yeah. Sit down with people, with the data that you have, and there's two sides to it. There's process and there's relationship. So you could have really, really good relationships with clients or individual people within clients but you're just not delivering the quality of the CVs or you're just not understanding the job specs that the client's looking for. And if you are leading organizations like that, you can use that data to help you understand where the pinch points are. Because usually it's not that they're doing everything wrong. It's that they're doing one piece of it. Like you oh. said, Paul, it could be that there's not enough coolant or the, uh, the oil <laughs> is low or you've just put diesel into a petrol car. Or you had a flat tire, Dave. Well, you've got a flat tire. Yeah. <laughs> Any one of those things, just and your job as a leader is to do, to identify what it is, to get the consultant or the manager or the director, whoever it is works for you, to own that, and then put a plan together to to, to make it work. It all sounds so simple when we talk like this. And, we've <laughs> times, and we've got it wrong many, many times. But that's 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 how I would that's how I would address it. So I think what we're saying is right, and you're right, let the data decide. But I think what we then spend too much time on is then pushing that data at people. And I think we should spend 25% of our time looking at what's happened, and that's the data, and 75% of our time then correcting that and developing ways to to, to build that. And that yeah. goes back to one of the questions earlier about building your strengths and weaknesses, understanding what they are, and looking at that you get more money from your strengths. So coach and develop your strengths yeah. and manage the weakness. And I think what we spend too much time is managing the problem rather than coaching and developing a way of getting ourselves out of that problem. So I think once you understand what the gap is, how are you going to coach and develop 
away from that problem and how are you going to manage your weakness? And I think there's there's the issue that we start to sort of get where we actually manage the problem constantly and push that problem further and further into people. And therefore, they get despondent by that rather than saying, right, we know that's the problem. Right. This is how we're going to get away from it. And having a clear plan and a clear strategy to move away yes. from that, I think, is the way to address your performance gaps and everyone can get on that journey with you. So last question, and this is a, a, an interesting question to sort of come out with. Remote working. And it's interesting that people are coming back to the office, but some people are still remote working. There's lots of hybrids going out and it's becoming more prevalent. Okay, So what adjustments or new approaches should a business consider to ensure their sales team remain cohesive, motivated, high performing? Because they trying to do that in a remote environment is really hard. So how do you do that? It's just a, it, you've got to communicate regularly and very well. Um, I mean, if somebody is working in a remote environment, as you say, um, and you don't see them very often or they don't come into the office terribly often, then you have to create an environment through this kind of method uh, and via phone calls, of course, uh, to keep people in the loop. And that means constant communication, constant meetings, if you like, um, keeping people um, aware of what's going on. You have to heighten your level of communication in every way, shape and form, whether it's written or verbal or it's face to face. And I think a failure to do that causes terrific issues, you know, out of sight, as they say, is out of mind. And if people feel disconnected with the business and they're not aware, and we just talked about the metrics and we talked about KPIs, but if they're not aware of what's going on in the business and there's there are large gaps in terms of um, meetings, whether that's virtual or face-to-face, -face, then of course you're going to get people doing the wrong thing, switching off, not feeling part of the business, not feeling part of the culture, unaware of what's going on. And that that level or that lack of information creates paranoia. If you don't know what's going on, you start inventing things. So it's just, I think, important to make sure that if people are working remotely, and that's the world we live in to a large extent these days, that you look and you think creatively about how do you keep people in the loop? How do you keep people uh, a part of the business and there are I mean we could spend hours talking about this we don't have the time but how what methods can you come up with what creative thoughts do you have to keep people feeling part of the business aware of what's happening um, infused and um, uh, I think delighted to be a part of the business how do you do that I think that there's some important strategies that need to be brought in it's not the same as having them around you every day you have to think differently I think um, as I'm as I was reading that question, how I was thinking, there's a whole forty five minute webinar. Yeah, <laughs> because it, it really is at the moment. It's the hybrid bit that most organisations are struggling with. You know, it's three days a week uh, work, two days at home, four days a week one day at home. Do I bring them all in? Um, there's there's a real tension out there um with the clients that we talk to about what do we do so i'm not i guess i'm not directly answering the question because paul's answered it so well but i, I do think that's something that we could explore as a yeah. uh, jump together because i think there's a lot um there's a lot behind it but uh, clearly the better the better you can communicate with those that are at home the more chance you've got of them delivering higher performance yeah I think I put it into four buckets, communication, appreciation, constant contact, trust. Yeah. And it's about how you drive that and drive those individual buckets to ensure that your team are motivated and high performing. And I think I've said this before on these, these webinars, you know, there are cultures out there that have been going for 50 plus years that have remote working constantly. So people like, Avon and Summers, etc., yeah. you know, are all remote working, but all have a brilliantly high performing sales culture and they're all proud of that culture. And I think that's yeah. how we learn from those type of things and look at it. And I think that's all about your communication, how you appreciate your people and that constant contact with them and to develop the trust that they can do that. So I think today's been a very sort of again a, a very different type of webinar for the, the normal one that we've been doing over the last three or four weeks. Um, but it really is about the catalyst. I think the managers are the catalyst. The culture is the catalyst to sales performance. And if we don't create that culture, then sales performance tends to suffer. So I think it's been a really interesting one. So thank you for attending. Next week, we are looking at 
attracting talent to work for you and how we attract talent and then how we nurture that talent and grow that talent. So we're going to carry this conversation on and come the conversation further. So again, if you've got questions, feel free to ask those questions uh, either via email to us. If you like the webinar, feel free to post it on LinkedIn. We'd love a little bit of free publicity every occasionally. <laughs> Mr. Jacobs doesn't know what LinkedIn is yet, but I'm sure he does at some point. Uh, but <laughs> we look forward to seeing you all next week. There's one question that's just popped into the Q&A box, uh, which came from Richard Bradshaw. Uh, hi, Richard. God, it's been a long time since seeing you, Richard. Uh, what you guys see, how much do you see systematic issues among recruitment agency managers, owners, that the day-to-day -day management and performance management is only ever outcome-focused as opposed to input focused. It's mm, a great question. Yeah, often observed myself that management's rarely inclined to drill down into the strategy and the quality of the comms in the areas of their, and I think, Richard, we're going to answer that all the same. I think the answer is very simple, is that if you're only output focused, then you're missing the point. And that's the problem with most KPIs, that they are output focused, where your KPI should be all about the input and it's the input that creates the output. And I think if you don't drill into the input and find out where the issues are, then you're never going to get the out output anyway. So it's, it is about having a look at that and the strategy of how you focus on the input to create the output. And input now comes from so many different areas. You've got to really sort of focus very heavily on it. So great question, Richard. Thanks for posting it. Uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, you're right. We should catch up, Richard. Um, so... As I say, next week, we're all about attracting talent to work for you and then how to coach and how to nurture that talent. So we look forward to seeing you all again next week. Dave and Paul, thanks for your input. Ladies thanks, and gents, Howard. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Bye, Goodbye. everybody.